can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Arit Oz of OzGlobalB2B.com. And Arit, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. This is part of my top agency series, but also my top Israel business leader series. So there's uh, a couple of cop agencies I've had. Um, Kevin Hurrigan um, started his agency. This You'll relate to this, Arit. Um, Back in, I think, 1995, he had an agency, right? And so Reed has been doing this. I'm not going to age you for for several decades as well. And he talked about the evolution of the landscape and everything else. So um, that was an interesting one uh, with Kevin Hergen of Spinia Tech. Um, on the um, Israel business leader side, I had uh, Moise Navone of Mobile Ion, and he talked about how mobilized journey of getting acquired to by Intel for $15.3 billion, but what kind of struck me with that conversation, Arit, was that um, he had to go back to his family at certain points and tell them, you know, we can't eat out anymore. We we can't do the niceties anymore because there's ups and downs. Um, and there's a lot of sacrifices that need to be made. So that was interesting. Also, um, you, a fellow uh, EO Israel member, uh, Nir Zavaro, uh, we talked about his book, um, uh, Fuck the Slides. So I guess I'll swear on this because that's the name of his book. But uh, it's a, and we talked about some of those um, how he came to create that uh, book and some of the lessons. Also, EO, EO Israel member Amit Astrecher of Extras and Genie uh, and how he lost all of his customers overnight, not once, but twice, and what he did. So check those out and many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. And we do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, we are kind of the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they can develop great relationships, create great content, and we do everything else. You know, for me, I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. And over the past decade, I found no better way than to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com to learn more. And I'm excited to introduce Arit Oz. She is founder of Oz Global B2B. Um, and she established Oz back in 1996 and transformed the company from a design studio into a leading full-service global B2B agency. And uh, Arit, you know, like I was saying before, for the past few decades, Oz has been instrumental in promoting Israeli industry in the global marketplace, but they work beyond Israel as well. And they work closely with customers to really create world-class brands across multiple sectors. And they cover the entire spectrum of B2B services from strategy to implementation. They're even a certified HubSpot partner. So they offer a comprehensive inbound marketing and, and marketing automation services as well. Uh, so Arit, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Start off and just tell people a little bit about uh, Oz Global B2B and what you do. So I actually, your introduction was really good. And uh, we, as you said, we are um, a company that uh, operates with uh, companies that have a, a technological product and sell it in the world. Um, we work with a wide range of companies and we help them from the, the brand strategy through creating their the identity, the visual identity, creating all marketing materials that they will need in order to sell around the world and um, helping them also with the digital marketing. So this is what's happening today. We didn't start from there. We started from actually uh, creating marketing materials, marketing communication, and really uh, helping uh, Israeli companies uh, sell their product uh, in the world. We'll walk through some examples and how that works, because I think it's instructive of any company um, going global. Like you, you're you forced, obviously, when you live in a small country to go global because yeah. there's the market. You can't just serve only the market in Israel if you want to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So 
um, you help some of these companies. They could, could be anywhere, but starting in Israel and go global. What, let's. What's the best example to start with of going so, from um, Israel and going global? So first of all, I, you, as you said, uh, Israel is a very, very small company, a country. And uh, so I think in general, uh, uh, we have a global mindset because the, the, the Israeli market is too small for these products. Uh, any startup, any company that starts in Israel always understands that their potential will be in the global market. Um, that's, that's, I think, one thing. The second thing is because we, uh, our expertise is business to business, that means that really the products that we uh, that we help companies sell, or they are usually uh, in verticals that are that Israel is very good in. We have a lot of uh, companies from uh, water technologies, filtration companies, companies that do uh, you know smart irrigation, all the agri tech uh, companies like that. So. In general, uh, uh, we look at the Israeli market as as like the better site. From the day that the product is uh, is ready, we will be looking in the global market. And I think that that's one of the one of the things that I've seen over the years is, you know, speaking to to agencies in Germany or in the U.S. They are very they they really know their market. But then, but we, from the minute we started, you know, our, our understanding is is the global mindset. I think that that is something that's interesting. Uh, we have quite a few companies from that have medical device, which is also a field that Israel is uh, very strong in. All different kinds of uh, monitors and uh, very very technological products that will, you know, like a, a motion controller that will sit inside uh, one of HP's uh, printers or things like that. So very very technological products. It's a specific way of marketing. You know, you the the people that you market to are professional people that's sort of what we do for our day to day yeah i mean we'll talk about i know that your company has gone through different evolutions throughout its lifetime but i you know you mentioned the water filtration um and water technology um one of those is um uh, i think it's medtronics right so yeah so um uh, medtronics is uh, is actually a really, really uh, great company. They are the company that invented the robots that clean the swimming pools. So it's not, they're not from the agriculture side there, but they are from cleaning water. And they focused from the day they started uh, on cleaning swimming pools. Over 50% of the market, the world market, which in general is something that always, I, I always feel that is so unbelievable. We have so many companies that, in their niche, in their place, they are really market leaders. They can be number two, number three in the world. But I think that's something that happens a lot in Israel, that, that you come out with a very, very good product. Many years ago, a lot of our, the companies we work with have been around many years. Matronics, I think, just uh, had 40 years, 40-year uh, anniversary. So Matronics, they, it's, a, it's a great example. They uh, uh, produce uh, robots that clean swimming pools. But as they sell in the world, they sell through partners. So if, if you think about, we started working with them about 15 years ago. So uh, um, the, all their marketing was through the partners, through distributors. It's something that's very, uh, happens a lot. <laughs> if you're watching, uh, if you're listening, there is a video here and we're at uh, OzGlobalB2B.com uh, right here. But you could see um, here is what we're talking about. Um, is right. this the right one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, uh, and you can see the case study in our in our website. So I think what I really like about the Matronics story is we uh, started uh, we started working with Matronics after they acquired the company in France, and uh, the the project was actually branding the acquisition of the two companies, and it they expanded their proposition and. It was the first time I think that a company, a technical company like them, really understood the power of the brand as being something that can can connect employees and connect uh, employees from all around the world, uh, and uh, also become a very very strong brand outside. So we work a lot when, when if if we you know to talk about what we do when we build the brand strategy, the brand promise is actually the tool that uh, will connect all the employees. 
to you know to why we why we get up in the morning, what we want to do in Matronics. It was uh, two simple words: exceptional experience. And I think that those two words of exceptional experience have been since really something that that, that with the values of the company and with uh, the promise, been something that really drove the company uh, forward. The company has grown is now in the, the Tel Aviv Exchange uh, Stock Exchange and one of the 15 biggest companies in Israel. They grew very much over the years. We created all their all their marketing materials, and uh, now as they've grown, they've brought in our uh, they brought in the services uh, in in house because they're already very very big, and we just help them with uh, things that they need. But we were really the ones there to create with them the brand and you know something that. Um, Talk about some think, of those uh, things, Reed, that you did do with um, with them. You know, the evolution of okay, you started with like you said the brand, but what are some what are some other things you had to do? Because I think it'd be instructive for anyone. Okay, here's what they did, and there may be other companies that want to go more global, even if they're in the U.S. and they want to go outside the U.S. Right? Obviously, there's a big market in the U.S., so some people aren't even thinking about going global. But there's obviously that expands the market there. So what are some of the things you did? What did they want initially when, when they first came to you? So, so the, I think the, 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 the big question was how uh, a company that started uh, in Israel, in a kibbutz, and uh, is growing and is becoming global, how do we keep the spirit and what made the success when we become global and become big? Because in the end, you uh, it's okay when you have, you know, all Israelis, they all get it, they understand the, the culture. Now you have employees in France and you have employees in Germany and you have employees in the US. And how do you connect them all together to one brand? So that was, I think, that that, that was the, the point where they, they understood that we need to have something that will connect everyone. The project we did was a global project. We did it with the global uh, management and actually, after we after creating the brand promise and after creating the values, there was like a roadshow going from country to country. The, we gave them the tools and the management went from country to country and did workshops and that we helped them with it. And actually, you know, bringing so that everyone, if you're an employee in Matronics, you all have the same language. One of the Points where we knew we 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 uh, succeeded was when the um, manager of uh, Matronics Australia phoned up the manager in Israel and said, "Listen, my one of my uh, employees came to me and said, listen, we have to change something we're doing. It's what we're doing here isn't an exceptional experience. It's really bad. We have to change it.'" And we said, "Okay, we we that that's what we wanted. We wanted that the, you know the everywhere where you are in the world, you understand that." If you are a Metronics worker and if you are um, producing Metronics uh, products, it will be an exceptional experience. Now, what you're showing here is what I, I've been talking quite a lot about the internal, but at the same time, we have a, we have a, the brand. We have we want all the marketing materials all around the world to look the same. And uh, later on, when we talk about digital marketing, we can talk about the challenge of building a global brand when you know in social media each country is very very different and that's that's something that we'll talk about later because it really connects us to the how the marketing is evolving and the challenges it brings but that when we did Matronics you know there were trade shows there were shops where where there were the you you saw the things and you should you saw the things and everything was the same looked the same we used to create the materials and distribute them all around the world and building really a strong uh, strong brand so you can see in the website you yeah read just describe what we're looking at because people may be just listening and also what did it look like before right now describe what we're seeing here and with the with the branding and then what was it like before this so, so um, first of all, what you're showing here is uh, a wide range of marketing materials. We can see an uh, exhibition booth. So if you think that whenever there's a, a trade show anywhere in the world, it always will look the same. The internet, uh, packaging, so everything, uh, you know, icons, explaining. It's one of the things that I think are interesting with uh, this is a product in the end gets to the house, it gets to the consumer, but it's still a very technological product. So usually 
the person that will recommend it is a professional person. So that's uh, now the, the, about the question how it looks. One of the things was that the product uh, is called Dolphin. And uh, for many years uh, in the world, they, it was known as Dolphin. It's still known as Dolphin by Metronics. But part of what we did in the brand strategy is really giving it the Metronics umbrella because in order to enable um, more product lines to come in. Over the, those 15 years, we've done, I think, about three rebranding each time, updating the look and feel making it um, more up to date, more connected to the new products because they come up with new products all the time. They um, and so the the um, what we do always connects to the business strategy of the of the, uh, the company. So if Matronics at the beginning had a premium product and later on they decided they're gonna uh, widen it to to you know you have now a lot of people have a swim pool in the in the garden that's um you know they bought an intex or whatever swim pool not to, so they they uh, develop uh, products that will work for there as well so our our work is always to support with the marketing materials and with the messaging to support the company's strategy so let's talk about you know i could see how you want the brand the strategy and the look and the feel to be universal. So wherever you are, um, people will actually recognize it. The The second part is also the digital marketing. What did you, what were some of the things you did on the digital marketing side? Cause I'm looking at this and it says, you know, digital marketing 360 SEO HubSpot webinars, smart content. What were some of the things you did on the digital marketing yeah. side? So, so actually I think uh, the digital marketing takes us a bit, Fast forward, so perhaps I'll change the example if that's okay with you. Sure. Well, uh, perhaps first of all, I, I can say a few words about how the how Oz evolved into digital marketing. Ten years ago, uh, we didn't have the technology we have today. So over the in the last about seven years, we we've, we've uh, added more and more capabilities in the company. Today, uh, about half of our activity in Oz is digital marketing. We have here a team that can really be extension of uh, of a, a marketing uh, department in uh, for our client. I said before that you know Metronics have really really grown they have a lot of the capabilities in house. So the example I want to give is uh, perhaps a different example as a company that doesn't have a very very big marketing department. They have perhaps um, a marketing manager CMO and perhaps a marketing communications or a digital marketing uh, um, manager and now in order to do a really effective uh, marketing uh, um, activities around the world you need about five or six different people each one with a different expertise you need someone to write the content and you need someone to do the strategy and you need someone to do the SEO and the PPC and the inbound and HubSpot and a lot of the, you know, the, I think the digital marketing has a lot of expertise in it. So the, the place that we bring value is companies that don't have the ability to, to, to bring in all these people. We actually, that's why we call ourselves your marketing partner. We become their partner and we become an extension of their, of their company, of their uh, marketing uh, agency. There's, uh, if you could see, there's a, a company, perhaps a good example is uh, Tefen. You can see here, Tefen is, uh, if we were talking about water technologies, they're, they're a company that sell to the, in the agriculture market. And there we're, we operate as an extension of their uh, marketing uh, department, really building up their, um, we, we did, we gave the whole package here. So we started building their brand strategy and updating their look and feel. But in the digital marketing, as you can see, it says here, digital marketing 360 degrees, which means we are like their team. So we we build a yearly plan. We build the, the content strategy, and then and we we really we have people here that are like their mark, the digital marketing managers, helping them uh, or doing the uh, the activities for the company. If they have a trade show now, so a month and a half before, we'll start promoting the trade show and uh, doing sponsored campaigns. And so it's really, you know, I think talking about it, I can say that one of the biggest advantages of Oz today is the combination between the branding capabilities 
and the messaging to the digital marketing. And, and we see out, you know, a lot of competition. There are either branding agencies or digital marketing agencies. There aren't many companies that have both capabilities combined very, very strongly. And it brings a big uh, advantage uh, because we see the whole picture. So if we, after we've created the brand, we know exactly what the what their value proposition is, what the messaging is, and and we start breaking it down and sort of uh, if, if we know we ha they have a trade show now, we will design the booth, but we'll also do the marketing materials, the company. So that that's a, a good example of a com a smaller company or medium sized company in Israel that we can really give them the whole package. I wanted to go back to your question and give an example because you talked about the global challenge. So I want to give a different, completely different uh, example uh, with a, a bigger company called Stratasys. Stratasys is, um, is, is a world leader in uh, 3D printers. Can so I ask you a quick actually, question, Arid? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk about Stratasys in a second. I just have a question about this one. One is why, why does Israel have so many more innovations around, you know, the water filtration and um, in that space, irrigation? I think the, the answer is very simple. Uh, half, more than half of Israel is a desert. Israel, Israelis, in general, the, all the notion of startup notion, the startup nation comes from, I think, our culture that when you have a problem, you have to solve the problem. So many, many years ago, when uh, we, we, we have a small country and half of the country is desert, the question was, okay, how do we grow agriculture in the desert? And from there, there were then all the drip irrigations and a lot of innovations came out. Also, all the, all the need for, for, I don't know if you know, but Israel has today I hope I'm not mad. In between 70 or 90 percent of the water in Israel is water that's been is uh, is desalination water, so water from the sea that has been. So we we um, and I and a lot of the innovation in Israel comes out from the po problems we have. So agriculture today, uh, there's no problem water in Israel because we uh, have all these desalination uh, plants and. In general, I think that's true for a lot of things that happen uh, in Israel. Water technologies and agri-tech are, you know, one of the leading leading innovations. And you look at our, our customers, you sort of get the range of what Israel uh, really uh, is strong in or, you know, what are there. And uh, you can see, yes, they're in the industry. So, you know... Um, um, you have agriculture here, you have water treatment, tech, medical, automotive, high tech, and manufacturing, B2B yeah. to, C, to C too. Yeah. Um, so. Anyways, I just wanted to, to ask about that. And then the second on the on this one Arid, is a webinars. What kind of stuff and work do you do around uh, with webinars for companies? Okay, so uh, one, of, one of the biggest challenges is to try and bring in new uh, and to bring it to, to buy and bring in leads to the company. We want to bring, make the exposure as big as possible, bring the awareness as big as possible. We found uh, it started in the COVID that uh, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll go back a step for, uh, before. Uh, one, of the, one of the tools that a lot of technological companies have is seminars. So what did they used to do? They used to bring over 15, 20 engineers for five days give them a very interesting seminar, take them around as well to see Israel, to learn about what's happening here. And that was that was one of the main marketing tools. When uh, the COVID uh, started, uh, everything stopped. And really, I think in two or three weeks, we, we came and offered them to do, instead of those seminars, we said, let's create webinars and do webinars. And really, we did a, a very, very fast shift. And what was unbelievable is instead of 15, 20 engineers coming over, suddenly we had 300 people all around the world listening to the webinar. Now, a webinar is um, when you create a webinar, you have to bring value to the people. So first of all, the, the people that come on the webinar are really, really 
uh, the the right fit. They're usually really good leads, potential customers. And uh, also one of the great things about the webinar is that it's a very, very strong marketing tool before, during, and after. So before we, you put up, you know, you uh, promote it around the uh, on the social media in email marketing, all the the there's a lot of awareness the there. that we have, yes. And then you start people start uh, registering. So 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 even if in the end the statistics say that about fifty percent of the people that register will attend. It's okay for us because when we do the webinar, we record it, and now we have content that we can distribute, and we have really, really good um, leads that you can uh, lead nurture, and you can send them uh, materials, and and you have questions. That we found that the webinar is, I think, one of the most powerful uh, marketing tools. Uh, the only thing that you need is really good content, and as long as you have good content. You can really, really uh, um, leverage it to to great things, and then afterwards you keep it online. People can download it. People can listen to it afterwards. So uh, I would say that webinar is one of our. You know, we have a lot of different tools. So the the webinar is one of the strongest tools. But in the end, when we build a marketing strategy for for a customer, online marketing strategy, what we try and look at the year and sort of have places where, you know, either it's a, a trade show or it's a webinar or it's a conference, sort of the anchors. And then we will create the, the marketing materials around that. And um... We'll talk about, you know, we are mentioning um, a read around the three phases, kind of the evolution of your company. You kind of, you know, went from graphic studio to branding to digital and doing all digital stuff. We'll we'll go back to kind of the inception where it came from the kind of the graphic side, kind of from the graphic to the branding. It seems that the matronics, and then we go from branding to digital, which is the uh, stratasis. So talk about some of the stuff that you did, you know, because it's interesting to see from a digital agency perspective the evolution that any agency goes. Some yeah. sometimes I found they've decreased their services and they started one and then some have grown because of the need of their clients or demanding of them these things um what what kind of work did you do with stratasis so first of all i just want a, a small correction from from our perception we mm -hmm. moved from being a branding agency to a marketing agency Today, in the marketing, a lot of the marketing uh, activities is online, is digital marketing, but not only. And I think that's part of uh, of uh, the understanding that you want to combine online and offline. So I think, the first of all, talk about the evolution of the company of Oz. It's from being, from supporting the marketing activities to really being uh, part of the marketing activities. Now, uh, I told uh, quite a long story about Tefin. It's a medium-sized company. Stratasys is a very, very big company, a global company. They have, uh, uh, they, I think they're, they're one of the two biggest companies for 3D printing. And uh, the big challenge that, uh, that we found there was, first of all, I'll say a few words about uh, Stratasys. They, they uh, produce... Uh, 3D printers, but they produce produce 3D printers for automotive and also for medical and for dentists and for aerospace. So you have so many different verticals. It's really it's a big challenge. So uh, you have that's one challenge. Many many verticals, many different uh, target audiences. And the second uh, challenge is that after all those uh, uh, things, we did also. Uh, uh, you want to do globally. So you want to do it in France and in Germany and in the US and in Asia and wherever it is. And um, what happens a lot of times is that if they're in, in one country, they're in the marketing uh, department of, let's say, Stratasys in France, there's someone that knows digital marketing. So they start working and doing, you know, posting online and doing things online. What we uh, understood is that the big challenge uh, in on um, social media is that you want to build a strong brand, which means you want your brand to look the same all around the world. 
if you think of Coca-Cola, there's no question, Coca-Cola looks the same uh, all around the world, but they do, even Coca-Cola has their sort of uh, adaptions, the local adaptions. So the, the, what we did here, the, one of the projects that we did was to create social media strategy, the global social media strategy for Stratasys, and to build the guidelines so that we built a guideline that talks about what you talk about, what are the values, it's a very, very big project, so I, you know, I, I won't be able to talk about it, but talk about it all. But in the end, the outcome was a very, very big manual that that gives explains all around the world how they need how they should work in the different on the different social media platforms. So how they work on how they need to work in LinkedIn, how on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever whatever they're doing. Also giving guidelines, but also understanding that they will, each country will have their own adaptions and each business unit will come out with their content. So the content comes, is created from all around the world. So you have sort of, it's, if you can think of it as something that starts from the headquarters down, but also from the business units up. Units up. So it's like, so it's, uh, and I think, uh, the output and it's it's a project that is evolving all the time it's not something you know digital marketing isn't something that stopped but it really uh uh it really sort of made sort of some kind of uh, um unit it made it uh unify if you can say uh what you're what we're seeing here is uh like the templates Templates for webinars, templates for if you're showing a use case, templates for different things that they can use. And um, uh, and these are now all around the world and they're working with them. It seems, uh, you know, Reed, like it seems very complicated because you have it, it would be complicated if it was just dental even. Right. But now, like if you're looking at the screen, we could see. You know, some of these 3D printing, there's a bunch of dental examples. Okay, that it's still a pretty complicated project because it's global and it's got to have, like you said, all the guidelines. But now you add, you know, you know, dental, you add healthcare, you add, you add all these other, yeah. you know, use cases. Where do you start with getting the like everyone on the same page even though there's different uses and products so so just uh, just to to clarify about the project that you were looking about uh, looking the dental the dental actually was it was a, str uh, a strategic project and it was to brand dental uh, division under strategies okay so um i think that's a good example when you work with very very big companies then you have these you have these projects that uh, strategic projects. So, what is the value proposition of the strategies uh, strategies uh, products for the dental market? That was a, a strategic project, and uh, and there are a lot of those going on. But what we were talking about before is, and you're right, it's really really complicated. Is really building some kind of guideline that is that um, on one side is uh, makes it clear to everyone how to how what the 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 tone of voice is going to be what uh what different kinds of content can we create uh how do we post on different uh platforms but on the other side to give them the freedom to really create their own content because we want the content you know if you have a, a perhaps key opinion leader that's uh, someone that works with their with with their printer somewhere, and, and you want them to publish content. We want that to happen as well. You know, we don't want it all to be corporate. But so it's it's a very uh, delicate sort of uh, balance between creating guidelines so that when people see content from strategies all around the world, they say, Ah, this is strategies. On the other hand, give the the freedom to really keep the and yes, it's it's a uh, complicated uh, projects and and also i think it's a project that evolves i think everyone's learning you know uh, learning this uh, the uh, this idea of how do i really create now i have social media and i have so many different sources of content coming out 
how do I really create strength in the brand? And um, it, it's something that uh, I can say that it's a big challenge. We see it. We see it with a lot of our customers. Not all the companies, uh, their their customers are online so much. So that's also you know something to understand their their countries or there are verticals where. Uh, there's a big question about are farmers online or not online? You know, where? How do I catch them? They have their mobile phone. They so yes, it, it's. Uh, I think the B two B in general is is uh, is a complicated uh, but very fascinating and interesting. Reid, how did you get started? Um, talk about the transition from employee to um, founder. That was you're taking me back thirty years back. <laughs> <laughs> from the beginning of the story. Actually, uh, I started my career with, in a company called Iskar. Iskar is a, is well known in Israel. I think it, it was maybe quite well known in as an industrial company that Warren Buffett acquired about, I think, seven, eight years ago. Uh, he still defines it as the best company ever acquired. It's a... It's a it's a company that that manufactures. First of all, they develop and manufacture cutting tools for the metal industry, leading in the world. Uh, they were acquired uh, for over four and a half billion dollars, I think, if I remember right, quite many years ago. Before you know, today, it's already become uh, the multiples have grown. But anyway, very very good company, and it was my my I would say uh, my school for for marketing. I. Uh, worked there in the marketing department as a marketing uh, communications uh, manager there and was in charge with the team for all the marketing communications of uh, Iskar in the world. So that was, you can understand, the sort of, uh, I would say, opened my path to my career. Uh, I worked there for five years. I loved every minute of it. It was a company that had great, budgets for marketing they really really believed in marketing which is something that a lot of times is very challenging in industrial companies a lot of times we have to persuade industrial companies they really need to invest in marketing they are much more into sales so it's kind of really uh, uh put in a lot it, the marketing was really the center of the company and um after five years of really doing from catalogs to multimedia to designing the website when it was really I think probably one of the first websites uh, industrial you know um, business websites in Israel and doing great things I just um, many times I've been asked about this I just had I felt I need to go I I want to do something uh, independently and it, it was it's strange it's something I thought about a lot since because I've been asked about it why do you leave a really great job? You know, I was uh, really successful and I really liked it to to start something by yourself. And I don't have the, the answer. I just think I felt that I want to do something for myself. I'm a very, very optimistic person and uh, a person that sees opportunities everywhere. So just it seemed to me that Okay, I'm gonna, you know, buy a Macintosh, and uh, I was a designer, so, you know, start designing uh, for companies that uh, want my uh, want my work. What happened uh, was that the expertise that I came out with, and the fact that I'm located in the north, which we didn't talk about, it's a bit unusual. I don't live in Tel Aviv, where everything happens in Israel. I actually live in the Galilee. So the combination of those two things, I think, uh, sort of made uh, brought to me uh, companies like Iskar that were technical companies. And very quickly, I started employing people and growing. And uh, I think one of the advantages there was I understood, even though we were a graphic studio, we understood we looked at the, the marketing materials through the marketing eyes. So we brought in something that I think was was then an advantage. And and the company grew very, very quickly. And uh, after probably a year or two, when I was finding myself designing at two o'clock in the morning, I understood I have to stop designing and going to. And since then, I've been uh, I see myself more as a marketeer and, you know, strategy and managing the company. 
uh, I think the the lessons I've learned from growing the company is probably a, a podcast by itself, so we won't go into it, but it's really um, what's one of those lessons? The biggest lesson I may I uh, took me a few, quite a few years is to really trust trust people, bring in people that know how to know to do things better than you do in their um, profession and and changing your job your my job today isn't doing the work it's actually mentoring people actually you know being really more a mentor more growing the people uh, in my team growing the, my managers that grow their teams and uh, uh, it, it was it was uh, something that took me I mean it's uh, not easy not easy to sort of go back give the responsibility 100% to the people that are under you. In my journey, I had nearly 10 years that I wasn't the CEO of my own company. I brought in the CEO, someone that grew up. So that was a big lesson of really uh, giving her the space and the responsibility of really managing the company while I went aside. That So uh, I think uh, it's uh, understanding that you know, we may do things very, very, we maybe maybe very good at things, but we make mistakes as well, like employees and that. And just to, to have the sort of, uh, to, to, to really have the understanding that uh, if you bring in really, really good people, a really good team, you can go. I, I have to say in that aspect that I understood a few years ago that uh, digital marketing will never be my mother tongue. It was, I, I, I talk about it as my second language. And I understood it when my son, my oldest son that's a digital marketer and he works in a technology company. When we spoke, when we talked together and we, I really understood that I will never understand digital marketing like he, he was born into it. So it's his mother tongue and it's my second uh, language. And I think that's an understanding as well that we bring a lot of experience. We bring, you know, wide, uh, you know, but. But in the end, uh, with all this technology and the world changing, I think it's really important to bring the people that can really, that really. Um... Yeah. So you obviously have hired team members that are, that's their, their strength. I'm wondering when you brought in a CEO, right? How did, what did your role look like at that point? So um, I, I for, first of all, for about, uh, two two years I just went back I needed sort of it was after seven years 17 years of managing company I just needed to get out of the everyday and uh and sort of bring my life back to myself I think uh, in, in a way and uh what what happened in from that uh, experience is that when I came back to manage the company uh two and a half years ago there was already uh the company was much more organized because me as an entrepreneur, you know, I, uh, I'm very, um, uh, I see opportunities all the time and what's the next thing and that. So first of all, my main role in those years were bringing the next thing, bringing in the next strategic project, bringing in the next trend, understanding what, being an entrepreneur, everyone talks about, you know, you have the visionary, visionary and the um, integrator. Yeah. Integrator. I'm a terrible integrator. Everyone always says that. It's really, really terrible. And uh, understanding that, you know, is, is a big understanding. So I, I love being in the more business development uh, place. That's what I did most of the time when I when I had a, a CEO. Coming back, I came back. I actually said uh, it's the first time I'm a real I'm really a CEO because because I started the company. I was in everything. I wasn't really a CEO. I was a marketing manager. I was a uh, account manager. I was, you know, after going back, coming back as to the CEO chair, I, I came back much more mature, much more, I think, ready and to a company that already had management. And uh, today I really see, I, I really see my role, as I said before, as, you know, being uh, as a uh, sort of a, uh, Managing the company, managing the, helping the team, you know, grow the business. Uh, I still seeing what's the next thing that we need, what's the next challenge, how, you know, how do we go forward all the time? That's, uh... I want to talk about mentors that have 
helped along the way. But uh, talk about how has EO uh, impacted you? First of all, in general, uh, talking about mentors, a- any junction I had in my career, I always had some, always had someone in front next to me. I never did it by myself. I never, whenever I had, you know, had a sort of jump to, to the next thing, I always, I, I really, really believe in finding the right people in the right stages and, and learning from people that uh, have done it. Uh, so that's uh, in general. I um, joined EO two and a half years ago. And the, the first thing I understood was I was so sorry I didn't join, uh, join earlier. Really, really. It, it, I joined uh, EO uh, in quite a challenging time. It was just before I came back to manage the company. And the, the first of all, um, when when you meet uh, in the forum or in the chapter, you you understand how most of the people around us in our everyday are employees. They aren't uh, business uh, owners. And I have really, I have really, really good friends that were CEOs of, of you know, really big companies, hundreds of millions of dollars and that. But in the end, it's not their company. And the when you meet people in EO, you understand there's there's some kind of uh, energy and uh, and also the safe zone that you're in, understanding that you know you, whenever you meet someone from EO, you can sit. You you never met them before. You'll sit after a quarter of an hour. You can you know open up your heart and say everything. And uh, I think uh, that those are the things that really, really, really have helped me. We're now, um, as we're recording this, we're in a very, very challenging time in Israel, a month into the war and all the terrible things that we've passed and the support that we've got from EO around the world. It's been it's really, there were days where I, I felt that they sort of pushed me, pushed me, you know, uh, to, to continue and to go forward and really to really. So it's from one side, it's the support from the other side. Really, to speak with people that have already been there, have done it, have uh, been down, been up. Uh, the the value that uh, I get from the forum is that I um, whoever I can recommend to join EO as a young entrepreneur, a young founder, I do. I really, I think it's uh, uh, it's really, really um, a great organization. I want to, uh, if people don't know what EO is, it's in, it's uh, called Entrepreneurs Organization. I think there's over, I don't know, 14,000 people in over 60 countries. Uh, so it's a global organization. It's where people get together and share what they're working on, challenges, struggles, and have a group to support that. So the other question, obviously, you mentioned this. Um, how has the war uh, affected your company? Explaining what's happening here is something that perhaps you know, I, I I understand that people don't really understand the reality we live in. Four and a half weeks ago, uh, with all the terrible things that happened here, first of all, Israel is a very small country. You reach, you, they say you reach any person with three connections. So you can understand that there isn't anyone here in Israel that doesn't know someone that was killed or that's been kidnapped or that's. Uh, missing. First of all, emotionally, it's a very, very big, uh, it's very, very difficult time, uh, um, and it still is. But then, uh, just to talk about what's happening in the everyday. So they've uh, there's 350,000 uh, men and women that's being called up to the army. Uh, one of my sons, a month ago, he's an engineer in a startup company. Put on his uniform, left his wife. And since has been, uh, he's in the North Israel training. Hopefully, he won't need to fight. But 350,000 people, men and women, have stopped their life and are now uh, in the army. Then, uh, for three weeks, uh, there were no schools. So, my team, I didn't say, but out of the 30 people in my team, I have 25 women, a lot of them young women with young children at home. So, three weeks at home with the children, but still continuing to work. Uh, while they're putting the, you know, making sure that the children are okay. Luckily, they've they've gone back to school and back the to to kindergarten. So 
that's made it easier. But after saying that, think of uh, a lot of places in Israel, two, three times a day, you get you have a siren, there are rockets coming over, you have to run into the bomb shelter. And after saying all that, we continue to work, we continue to deliver, we have our, our customers, have customers all around the world, we know the world is continuing to work. And uh, under all those challenging um, situations, we continue to work. I think the biggest impact it's had on us is that everything has slowed down. So for me, my main focus today is to retain my team and to, to try and bring in work from outside of Israel. As we were saying, most of our clients are headquartered in Israel with global operations, but we do have customers from outside uh, Israel. And uh, the understanding that uh, if we succeed to bring in, you know, if there are more companies that really can uh, value from our expertise, from our uh, experience and bring in projects from outside of Israel, that would be my, that's the main thing I'm now focusing on in the, you know, trying to bring in uh, work so that we can, uh, we talk about continue to, uh, to the Israel um economy needs to continue to run that's part of our strength here we can't just stop the economy so from us we get up in the morning to, in order to do that to continue uh, to run the israeli economy and to uh, to really serve our customers and hopefully to bring our expertise and our experience to other companies in the world so from it's just an, an example of how from such a big challenge I hope there'll be an opportunity here and really uh, to do it but it's it's been challenging uh, times emotionally and uh, you know what's going around but even so uh, I think that we're, we're strong people and we we don't have a choice and uh, we'll continue we'll continue to succeed just to say as well that to, to see the impact it's it's had on the world is also very very it's really hard for us to see how Jewish people all around the world have really been impacted from this and uh, it's not easy but I think you know we're we we're optimistic people, and we believe that we believe in, that we will, uh, you know, continue and uh, grow from this from this big big uh, crisis that there's been here. Yeah, Rita, first of all, I hope your son and everyone else, you know, stays safe. Um, Thank you. And on the the global strategy, you know, so anyone thinking of okay, we need this global strategy, we need these guidelines to build because we're all over the you know, all over the map, who are ideal, who are some of the ideal companies that you think of maybe that aren't in Israel that would be a good fit uh, for your company? So, so that's a great question. And um, I can give an example, an example of a, quite a, f a few years ago, five or six years ago, I got an email from a, from a company called Axion located in California, family-owned company that uh, they are in water technologies. They uh, manufacture um, very uh, special uh, membranes, it's called. So very, very uh, micro filtration. Like the membranes he, that are around membranes. Membranes, yeah. Membranes, I think yeah. you say right. Is that the right one? It's for it's for desalination and for very 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 micro filtration. He sent us an email and said, "I'm uh, I would like to to have a, a meeting with you and because I want to do a brand strategy project." And I said, "Wow, hasn't got any connection to Israel. Doesn't know. He just and I said, and when we when we met, I said to him, "How did you how did you hear about us?" And he said. Well, I actually, I, I'm following your customer, your main customer. That that time it was Amiad. Amiad is one of the leading filtration companies. And he said, I'm so fed up of trying to explain to agencies around here about my industry that I thought, I'll see who does Amiad's work. And, uh, our, you know, our credit was on the website. And that's how he got to us. And we we actually built his brand strategy, created all his marketing materials, implemented HubSpot there, did everything and gave and from there he continued with a local agency, but we built all his materials. So that that's one example. Uh, so that example talks about really uh, industries that we're really really good in. But after saying that, any B two B company that uh, want, that operates globally or wants to operate globally, I think we can we can help 
brand strategy, you can help in creating marketing materials. We have uh, we have storytellers and designers here that do unbelievable uh, presentations, investor presentations, marketing presentations, sell tools. So a, a lot of marketing uh, materials that we we create, and and the examples that we talked about of like really creating a global strategy for social media or um, uh, doing a webinar or anything that uh, I think that. The, the companies that are best fit are the B2B companies that operate globally or like Axel wanted to. He was working, he was operating in, in uh, US and wanted to grow to global market. As I gave examples of medium size or big size, it depends, you know, the, the, the different size companies have different challenges or different needs that we can really uh, uh, help in. First of all, I want to be the first one to thank you. Uh, everyone should check out ozglobalb2b.com to learn more uh, about what they're working on. And um, just thanks. You know, I can't imagine going through what you and your surrounding family and friends are going through and still just pushing forward to just business, not, not necessarily business as usual, but but from the companies you're working with, it's, it's kind of business as usual. So uh, thanks uh, for sharing your lessons and your story. And uh, we'll see everyone next time. So great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.